Hello, Kichimigwich Kapisiang. Thanks for joining us on InVision, our first news program here on APTN. Before we take a look at this week's stories, we want to introduce ourselves. Behind me in our newsroom from Winnipeg, some of our InVision staff. I'm Carol Adams. My background is Cree and Dene, originally from northern Saskatchewan. I'm your host for InVision News. In fact, the majority of our news programming and technical staff is of First Nations, Métis, or Inuit ancestry. They are the people in our newsroom, behind the cameras, and in the control room. Our purpose, telling the stories of our people from the perspective of our people. Since television news first began many years ago, the mainstream media has tended to focus mainly on negative stories when talking about our people. The truth hasn't been reflected until now. We at Envision won't concentrate only on the negative, although negative news may be part of what you see. Instead, we will also include celebrating our people's successes, talking about goals, values, and our way of life. Someone asked me, how would you describe Envision News? The best way I know how is to tell you a story. It's a poem written by me that personifies what Envision will strive to be like. Our people love to laugh. On the face of an old grandma, the laughter, the smile lines emphasize wrinkles, reveal chipped or missing teeth, and in the eyes is revealed the strong and beautiful spirit of that person. If Envision were a person, Envision would be that grandma. The wrinkles, the map of a long, hard road traveled. She'll tell you stories about hardship and pain, discrimination and denial. But through the smile, a constant reminder about the humor, love, and strength and spirit that helped overcome. The missing teeth, a sign of battles fought, battles won, and battles lost. And in the eyes, triumph, hope, and caring. She always takes care of her people the best she knows how. Envision can't be that actual grandma, but we can adopt the principles, the values, and the character into our news programming. We've been given the honor of being storytellers. We've been entrusted with this responsibility. It's a responsibility we respect. And with that, our top story. A judge in New Brunswick has ruled Mi'kmaq people do not have a treaty right to cut wood on Crown land and sell it. The case involved Joshua Bernard, a Mi'kmaq from the Eel Ground First Nation in New Brunswick. On Thursday, he was found guilty of cutting trees on Crown land without a license. He was fined $300. A similar case is going on next door in Nova Scotia. It involves 35 Mi'kmaq loggers charged with cutting wood on Crown lands in that province. As Envision's Maureen Gugu explains, one of those loggers charged in Nova Scotia is frustrated over Bernard's conviction. There's five crews in here cutting for about a year and a half, making a reasonable living. Not, no one was getting rich, but we were making a living. That's the main thing. Lefty Paul checks out the area where he and his crew were cutting trees last year. He took out $100,000 in loans to buy equipment, and he hired up to 20 men to cut trees on Crown land located just outside of his home reserve, Indian Brook. Lefty and his workers cut trees in areas like this and sold the wood. We were told we had a treaty right to come out and cut, so I was going to exercise my right and come out and make a living. I needed, a, I needed a job, basically. That's made me feel real good to see all them guys working and happy and their kids having, I mean, springtime, their kids getting new bikes. They're, I mean, just their kids need something, they go out and buy it, no problems. But the Nova Scotia government disagreed with Lefty. Lefty and 34 other Mi'kmaq loggers throughout the province were charged with illegally cutting and removing trees from Crown lands. Conservation officers with the Department of Natural Resources hauled out most of Lefty's cut and sold it, but not all of it. Some of the remaining logs have been sitting here along this logging trail for almost a year. On Thursday, a judge in New Brunswick handed down his decision in a case that is similar to Lefty's, the Joshua Bernard case. 
the judge ruled Mi'kmaq do not have an Aboriginal or treaty right to cut and sell timber on Crown lands. Lefty is just plain frustrated with the ruling. I want to go back to work. I want to come back out here, start harvesting trees again. The legal battle over who holds title to Crown lands in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia is far from over. Joshua Bernard's guilty verdict is likely to be appealed. In the meantime, the case involving 35 Mi'kmaq loggers in Nova Scotia resumes in Halifax on Monday. That case will hear evidence for the next two months before it wraps up. A decision isn't likely until the fall. Maureen Gugu, in Vision News, near the Indian Brook Reserve in Nova Scotia. Members of the Chiam Band in British Columbia have set up a roadblock after talks with the provincial government collapsed. Chief June Quip says her patience has run out. Friday night, four concrete barriers were dragged onto the Rosedale Ferry Road near Agassiz. It's a crucial piece of land the band wants transferred to its ownership. The Chiam have also threatened to put up a toll booth on Highway 9, but Quip says that won't happen until B.C. responds to the blockade. A B.C. official says the band's actions prove they aren't interested in talking. Peter Smith of the Aboriginal Affairs Ministry says the Chiam demanded four islands in the Fraser River without public consultation. Premier Ujjal Dosanjh says he won't negotiate with the band because of the blockade. The year 2000 started off very poorly in terms of relations between police and Aboriginal people in Saskatoon. As the year progresses, relations aren't improving. It's because of what Daryl Knight has been saying. He is 33. He's originally from the Soto First Nation. He now calls Saskatoon home. But after what he says happened one cold night in January, home might not be how he feels about the city anymore. It was minus 20 degrees. Daryl Knight says he was picked up by two city police constables, Ken Munson and Dan Hatchin. Knight says the police drove him to the outskirts of the city, took away his winter coat, and left him. It's the same area where other First Nations men have been found frozen to death in the past. There's no indication that Daryl Knight's complaint and the previous deaths are related. But because of that factor, the RCMP took over the investigation. Earlier this week, the two officers were charged with assault and unlawful confinement. To talk about how this story is being viewed by the community, we spoke with journalist Doug Cuthand out of Saskatoon shortly after the charges were laid. Thanks for joining us. I, I wanted to start off by saying I understand there were two types of reactions to the charges being laid. Can you describe that to me? Yeah, I've talked to a number of people about this and people on the, the street and other people that have spoken to me on, over the phone who said that they were quite surprised. In fact, they're quite shocked that they actually came out with charges. Uh, there was a very low level of expectation out there, I guess, and uh, quite a few people are quite pleased about that. On the other hand, uh, Chief Perry Belgard of the uh, head of the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations was on record in the uh, media saying the that uh, he wished the charges extent. had been much stronger. In fact, he was looking at things like uh, uh, attempted murder. All right, but I understand as well that, that that type of charge would be hard to prove in this case. Now, the other thing is the, uh, the charges do go to court on May 3rd. There have been calls for a judicial inquiry, but I'd like you to tell me about the calls for uh, overhauling the justice system in Saskatchewan as a whole. Can you talk about that? Yeah, we have an Indian Justice Commission attached to the Federation of Saskatchewan Indian Nations, and they've made a call for a far greater uh, uh, inquiry that would take a look at uh, the, the, the courts, the justice system in general, uh, corrections, the uh, whole uh, area of uh, parole, probation, and uh, policing in remote communities. There's, there's a whole broad range of issues here that have come to light over the past uh, number of, of months here. Just not, it's not just the, the more blatant things of the, the, the bodies being found around Saskatoon, but it's just an ongoing situation here in this province. All right. Well, that, that type of inquiry, obviously, we wouldn't hear about until after this case has gone to court. But uh, I thank you for joining us today. Oh, you're very welcome. And that was Doug Cuthand joining us from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. The two police officers accused of dumping Knight have had their pay partly reinstated. 
Constables Dan Hatchin and Ken Munson will get back pay from the time they were suspended last month until they were charged. Ipperwash Provincial Park is about an hour's drive from Sarnia, Ontario on Lake Huron. To the people of the Stony Point First Nation, a piece of it is sacred land, the burial ground of their ancestors. The province promised that it would be protected, but it never was. So in September 1995, the people of Stony Point moved in to protect it themselves. Anthony O'Brien Dudley George was one of them. It was a peaceful occupation, but the Ontario Provincial Police sent in riot control units to break it up. Dudley George was shot fatally by a police sniper, Kenneth Dean. Dean was convicted of criminal negligence and given community service. The George family was outraged. They demanded a public inquiry. They just now scored a victory in their case. The Ontario government must turn over all documents pertaining to the confrontation. In Visions, Ken Williams now brings us this report of a family's search for justice. I can still remember the call that came in that night, about 10 after 11. I was sitting down to watch the, the news, and um, I re received that call that saying that Dudley had been shot. He'd been taken to, to the Strathroyd uh, Middlesex Hospital. It was here Dudley George was shot by Kenneth Dean, once in the leg, then again in the chest. He managed to stagger to this point. It is here his brother and sister picked him up and put him in this car and took him to the hospital 35 miles away. I believe he was singled out. Um, he was asked earlier that morning if he would like to be the first one. It's my belief that the Premier of Ontario was trying to make a point. What do you think in the point was? They're going to show the other Premiers on how to handle these Indian problems. I'm pushing for this public inquiry because I believe that the truth must come out as to why, why Dudley was shot. Why are they fighting us in court so hard? Why didn't they just turn over the document? Why haven't they called the public inquiry? Um, even though Premier Harris may be outside talking to a group of people saying he's cooperating in every way with the George family lawyers, but in the same time, his lawyers are in the courts fighting to, to stall this thing and stop it, trying to get him out of it. Why are they fighting so hard to get him out of it? They've tried all kinds of um, tactics to to slow this down. So this led us into again into more of the court proceedings, and finally we have a court order which forces him to to produce this stuff. Sam George is not alone in this fight. He was recently in Toronto to attend a symposium on human rights that was put on by the Coalition for a Public Inquiry into the death of Dudley George. Your attendance here today once again makes it very clear to us that people have not forgotten Dudley George nor what he died for. Dudley had that right to stick up for his land. Dudley had that right to protect his ancestors which were buried in that park. My brother was a, a happy-go-lucky guy. If he was here today he would be sitting up there someplace telling somebody a joke. We are fighting the provincial government, the Premier of Ontario, some of the ministers within that government, and also the Ontario Provincial Police. We want a public inquiry. Even though our fight continues, our people across the country are still getting gunned down, beaten, left to die. If I could talk to him right now, I'd be, I would tell him that I would be very glad that, that I would be able to talk to him, to, to maybe give him a hug, um, and just to speak to him, just to joke around with him, is what he meant to me. He meant very much to me because he was my brother. Ken Williams, Envision News, Toronto. It's been just over a year since the official birth of Nunavut. 
But it was last Thursday at a special ceremony in Ottawa that the new territory's coat of arms was unveiled. APTN was there. On behalf of the uh, Premier of Nunavut, um, I would like to uh, take this opportunity uh, to uh, thank you uh, for um, this uh, participation on this uh, important occasion this morning. Uh, Nunavut Court of Arms um, is a plan of uh, Nunavut uh, people. Uh, Inuit, um, Inuit uh, life, uh, Inuit culture is a hunting society. So the um, animals that you see, the, um, the, the narwhal, the caribou, the igloo, the significance of uh, where Inuit have been in the past uh, in terms of shelter, in terms of survival, in terms of uh, Inuit working together. All these things put together uh, represent uh, Inuit way of life, which is uh, teamwork, which is a unity. The Senate of Canada ratified the Nishka Treaty this Friday, ending the nation's 130-year fight for land rights, economic freedom, and self-government. The treaty guarantees the Nishka more than 2,000 square kilometers of land in northwestern BC and $253 million. In vision was there when the Senate vote was passed. Yeah, 3.53 today, April 13th. The Senate of Canada gave its approval to the Nisca Treaty. We're extremely pleased. What goes through your mind and your emotions when you see it? When you feel well, I think my colleagues and I uh, remember those who went before and paid so much to enable us to be here today. On Monday, over 18,000 voters will elect the next Yukon government, but outstanding land claims are forcing the mainstream parties to seek the First Nation vote. Gordon Loverin sent this report. In 30 years, Yukon First Nations have come from being merely wards of the state with no voting privileges to leading who will next govern the Yukon. The campaign has focused on land claims and devolution as top priorities. Now, are there any terms or documents for cabling? Devolution would give a Yukon government province-like powers. But there's a hitch. First Nations say Canada must settle with them first. With half of the land claims in the Yukon still in negotiations, the NDP, Liberals, and the Yukon Party truly recognize the voting power of First Nations. Well, the Aboriginal vote uh, in the communities and in Whitehorse is very important uh, to, to this party. It always has been. Um, it's been, uh, it's been important even when uh, land claims issues were not the, the top prior, prior priority. First Nations voters also have the opportunity to look at the previous two um, governments and their records. And our commitment has been clear, particularly to the land claims agreement. As a party, we have committed to the umbrella final agreement. And this time, we have four First Nation candidates running for us. The Yukon Party has made a real breakthrough there. However, what is new is the importance the First Nation voters will play in tomorrow's election. Will they agree that the NDP are one clear choice or that the Liberals really are all about the future? Or will they instead agree that the Yukon Party now, more than ever, should govern the territory? Each of the leaders are hopeful their courtship will pay off at the polls. For InVision, I'm Gordon Loverin in Whitehorse. More than a century after his death, Louis Riel continues to make history. The Pangman family in Winnipeg has passed Riel's field glass from generation to generation. Last month, they gave it to the Manitoba Métis Federation. It's a small brass telescope. It's broken and worn, and it doesn't really work anymore. But if it didn't belong to Louis Riel, it probably wouldn't be newsworthy. 
like a piece of a puzzle. It tells us a little bit more about Louis Riel and the person he really was. The field glass is now on loan to the St. Boniface Museum in Winnipeg. Envision's John Stevens files this report. The St. Boniface Museum is located a few hundred yards from Louis Riel's final resting place. It's quiet and it's gloomy. And it's in stark contrast to the excitement Riel lived and created as one of Canada's most well-known historical figures. Museum director Philip Mayotte says we get a glimpse into the real lives of people when we see their possessions firsthand. Possessions such as Louis Riel's spyglass. What an object like this does, uh, it, you know, we don't have a picture of Louis Riel with the field glass or we don't have a recording or notes of him standing on top of a hill watching the approach of the troops or anything like that. So, but <laughs> because it's a piece, it's a physical piece, piece that belonged to him, a, phys a physical artifact or a possession, it allows visitors to sort of see Riel as a person rather than simply as a, as a, as a rumor or as a, uh, a reputation or what have you. This is what happens with larger than life figures. You, you, you sort of, you get caught up with the reading of what they did and what they said and so on and so forth. You almost forget that they were living, breathing human beings. So in the museum world, what we like to do is when we have artifacts, we try and tell the story of this, this person, but we also try and remind people that he's a living, breathing, or he had been a living, breathing uh, individual, and that you can do by having objects that belong to him. And that's why the field glass is significant, uh, is a sort of a significant addition to our displays and our collections here. But from the objects that we have, uh, uh, you can see that he was, he did not have a lot of material possessions. You know, the items that we have that belong to Riel are things that are fairly simple. Uh, you know, again, the, uh, a moccasin, a, a simple wool toque. Um, he has, we have a small pistol, and it's a little 22 caliber gentleman's gun. So Riel was not a sort of a buckskinned, horse riding, buffalo hunting, Métis, like many of his cousins and so on and so forth. This guy, I guess, perhaps in, in his world, he might have been seen as something of a dandy. And with people like Riel, uh, these items sort of belong to the public and belong in a public institution where generations can come and visit them and see them and uh, sort of commune with them, you know, almost spiritually. I've had people who've sort of almost wept at the, you know, at the sight of Louis Riel's coffin. Sort of for them, that brought it all home to them. That you can do in a museum. You can't do it if the item is, you know, is in a closet somewhere, you know, uh, in, a, in a box, uh, you know, because someone thinks it's really neat they have it. You can't replace these things. You know, people say they're priceless. They're priceless because, not because they're worth a fortune, they're priceless because you can't replace them. Louis Riel's coffin is priceless. It's, you know, it's $10 worth of lumber, but it's Louis Riel's coffin. How do you replace it? You can't rebuild it. You can't recreate it. You can't you know, make a new one or find a new one. It's, so those are, you know, why these things need to be in museums and we do the best we, we can to look after them and make sure they'll be around for, you know, 100 years from now so people who are still reading about Riel, as they will 100 years from now, can come and see pieces that, that belong to him. For InVision News, this is John Stevens in Winnipeg. A white buffalo, thought to be a prophecy come true, was shot on the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota three weeks ago. It has left many wondering why it happened and what it means. Joe Marivelle owned the buffalo named Medicine Wheel. The white buffalo calf's birth in 1996 caused quite a stir. Sioux Prophecy says it would mark the revival for Aboriginal peoples. The prophecy also says this buffalo will change color as it matures, white, black, yellow, red, and then back to white. Medicine Wheel had turned brown and was in the black phase when she was shot. A lot of us live away from home, away from our roots. We do it for many reasons like work or school or in search of a dream. The visits back home seem to become further and further apart. The letters and the phone calls become less frequent as well. So tonight on Envision, we are starting a new way of going back home. Letters home will be a regular feature. Our first letter is from Jennifer Brandt. She is from Tyendinaga Mohawk Territory in Ontario. Jennifer left home to go to school. Since then, she has lived in Peterborough and Thunder Bay, Ontario. Now she lives in Winnipeg, Manitoba. She's studying business commerce at the University of Manitoba. 
Jennifer doesn't get to go home very often. She has a big family back in Tyendinaga. Her mother passed away six years ago. This letter is to her father. Dear Dad, this is the lounge that I'm sitting in here at the University of Manitoba's Faculty of Management Aboriginal Business Education Lounge. So this is where I hang out. Uh, I have four exams to write and they're all pretty tough. Once this is all over then, then I can come home finally. It's been such a long time since I've been there. I guess it doesn't matter if you're two hours away like Toronto or 24 hours away like here in Winnipeg, but still hard to adjust to. It's always people moving. You miss the, miss the wilderness, I guess. Miss the wilderness of, of being in the country. But there's some things about Winnipeg that aren't that great either. <laughs> so I guess that's what I'm trying to, to deal with right now, and that has to do with has to do with racism issue. I've never, never been confronted with this kind of thing before. And it has to deal with the classroom, and it has to deal with the professors, and it has to deal with the statements that they make. And how do I stand up for that? And how do I give my opinion as a student, as an Aboriginal woman in that classroom, and having to take this, this crap from these professors. Dad, I, I, I can't talk to you about the, it in any more detail right now because it's becoming an issue. To get this degree, it's going to help me in the next step in reaching my goals of, of wanting to be some kind of a leader in some way with helping Aboriginal communities, First Nation communities. And one of my personal goals is to maybe become the the leader with the Association for Iroquois and Allied Indians. And that is just since since my grandpa did it and you're a part of it, I wanna partake in that as well. I wonder what mom would be thinking about while I'm doing this and where she thinks I have my head on straight <laughs> or, or if I'm actually going ahead and doing doing a good thing. Uh, I know she would say well, whatever you do you, you will do very well. Dad, the next time I see you I want to give you a great big hug. Love, Jennifer. Or love me. Amiwe Pinama Mina Kawabam Egnawa Miigwech. That is all the time we have for InVision News tonight. I'm Carol Adams. Thanks for joining us. If you do have any comments about this week's program, please fax us at 204-946-0767. We'll see you later. Skamaka. <laughs>